this week's edition of Focus on Connecticut. I'm Tom Appleby, and our guest is the congressman from the 4th District, Jim Himes, Democrat. Good to have you with us. I'm great to be back. It's been quite a while. In fact, we have certainly not talked since you won that election, your right. second uh, term in office. That was quite an election. An era, the, the seat was targeted. Republicans were expected to win across the country. Of course, Connecticut was a bit of an aberration, and you held on to yours. Yeah, obviously, I uh, was delighted by the outcome in the end, but it was a very uh, anxious uh, campaign cycle. Uh, emotions were running very, very high. There was all uh, sorts of concern over what had been done, what had not been done uh, in Washington, D.C., and people were really fired up. And uh, look, at the end of the day, I was grateful that the constituents of the 4th District decided to return me and return me pretty solidly. I ended up winning uh, by six points, which I'm not sure I would have predicted in advance, but it, uh, uh, it was a nice thing, a nice validation of a couple years of hard work. Was the race a nice thing? Did you feel that things were handled properly on both sides? You know, I think, uh, I actually think that uh, Dan DeBussell and I did a pretty good job and focused on the issues. We took some swings, but it never got personal. It really not, it didn't get into personal background, it didn't get into motivations, and you know, yeah, we were pretty tough on each other on the issues, but particularly relative to some of the other races we saw in Connecticut, I think it was a pretty clean race. I know the one debate that we took part in, it seemed very civil. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's the way it should be. Look, at the end of the day, people get turned off by a process in which it, in which it becomes about personal issues or attacks really become angry. I want to point out we're taping this program on Tuesday, by the way, just to accommodate all of our schedules. Uh, so who knows what's happening over in the Middle East by the time this airs on Saturday and Sunday. But there's a lot going on right now, particularly in Egypt. It's chaos, very undecided. What are your thoughts about it? Well, what we're seeing in the Arab world generally is a remarkable, remarkable thing. Of course, it started in Tunisia, another country that had been under the thumb of a fairly despotic leader for a long time, and it has now spread into Egypt. We're hearing activity in Yemen and in Jordan, you know, places like Syria, you've got to wonder if they're next. It's a scary moment in the sense that we don't want anything to occur which, you know, allows radical Islam uh, uh, to come to power in Egypt to threaten us or to threaten Israel. On the other hand, every time we back a dictator, and this is, goes back to Somoza in Nicaragua, to the Shah of Iran, it ends badly for us. So I think the president is doing the right thing by saying we stand with the Egyptian people and saying that this happens because the regime has not allowed for freedom of expression, for freedom of politics, even really for the development of prosperity. So I think the president is doing the right thing by standing by the people, and hopefully what we see is a calm and nonviolent transition to a much more democratic system. The, the reason we stand by despots is because it's in our interests. That they, they're willing to go along with our needs at that moment. So much of what we see America doing, and nations, we're not alone in this, is worrying about the moment. How do you get that long distance view? Well, you're exactly right about that. At the moment is exactly why we do it, and it always has long term consequences. You know, we backed the Shah of Iran so hard for so long that in 1979, when he finally lost his grip, of course, the popular revolution was defined as anti U.S. Didn't necessarily have to be that way, but because of our back for the Shah for so long, it, it turned out that way. So uh, we have a real interest, and look, you know, George Bush understood this, and I think across party lines we understand we have a real interest in pushing those of our supposed allies, and I'm talking about not just Egypt here, but Saudi Arabia and uh, and, and, and others, uh, to liberalize because it becomes a powder keg in uh, over time. And if it goes reactionary, if it goes Muslim, and poses more of a threat to Israel and hence to the United States to some degree. We go along with that because it's the will of the people. Well, you know, here's where it gets here's where it gets challenging. Um, and uh, regardless of who you are in Egypt or who you are in Jordan, you know that the U.S. stands behind its ally in Israel. Uh, it is uncomfortable for Israel to imagine that uh, whoever replaces Mubarak could uh, renounce the peace agreement, which has defined the relationship between Egypt and Israel for so long. It's horrifying to think that uh, radicals could assume control 
all in Egypt. This is the largest uh, Arab country in the world. Um, but democracy is a process, and ultimately, in the long run, democracy will allow people to speak. People always point to Gaza as an example of where a democratic election resulted in an outcome that we all agree is an awful outcome with Hamas. That's why I hope we see a transition where the judiciary, other institutions, a free press, help sure that whoever's elected is A, moderate, but B, also observes the Constitution. Um, but you, you put your finger right on the reason there is a lot of anxiety right now, which is that you can't predict an outcome uh, when there is chaos. I'm going to take a break. When we come back, let's talk about what you can pre predict in terms of what's happening in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Right, right after this. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Closed captioning is brought to you by IOTV with incredible HD picture and sound. IO